Hey, it's Jamie, and welcome to a selects edition of Eventual Millionaire. This is where we go back and find the best of the best, the ones that you loved from the past six seven years. We've been doing this a long time and there's some amazing interviews with amazing guests that you have not seen yet. So we are bringing them back. It is the Selects Edition. Let us know what you think and I hope you enjoy. Potent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Masters, and today we have Ray Zinn back on the show. I'm so excited. He wrote a book called Tough Things First, and we had a great conversation last time. Thank you so much for coming back on the show today. It's just wonderful to be with you after a long trip. It's been four years, and you were just telling me about your crazy schedule, like the fact that you're doing this much work, right, when you don't have to, and this much travel and this much speaking, what makes you still go so hard after all these years? I want to help. I'm just trying to give back. I, honestly, that's the reason. That's amazing. So I met with two universities over the last two days and spoke for hours. What was the highlights? Tell me about what you told them. Well, the highlight was is that uh, in, in these students, and you know, nine out of ten companies fail within the first three years. Mm. And I said, you know, you have to have enough air in your tank, you know, because you're going to be underwater, you know, to survive until you can get to the surface. So the thing was just to teach them how to form a, a good team and then how to build, you know, a, a good company as opposed to necessarily having a great idea. You know, a lot of people have great ideas, but they don't have a good team. And so therefore, you know, you, you really can't execute. And so that was the, the key was to teach them about developing a good team. Don't worry about the idea. The idea will come because two heads are better than one. And so, you know, if you put together a good team, then you have a better chance of, of coming up with a great idea with the team, okay? And then you can do a, uh, you know, start your company. But make sure you have enough runway to, to get back to the surface as you would and, and, and survive. Okay, we're gonna break this thing all the way down. So especially for somebody that's just starting out or doesn't have any hardcore employees, maybe they have contractors, who do they hire first? How do we start building a team, especially if we don't have crazy resources? Well, you know, that's that's the problem is you have to find people who are like minded, people who have the same vision and goal that you do, people you can work with and that you can get along. Um, you know, I was talking with a, a, a lead at, at uh, West Virginia University yesterday, and uh, she was telling me on the way to the to the university campus that she broke up after six years with her boyfriend and there, there was not a good partnership. Uh, they didn't trust each other. There was no loyalty. Uh, and, and so here she is. She says, I'm 30 years old. I'm starting all over again. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like a company, isn't it? I mean, you, you know, your partnership, whether you're in, in, in a marriage or whether you're in a, you know, just in a relationship or, or whatever, the partnership is extremely important, not just in a marriage, also in business. So you want to make sure you're, you, you're affiliating and you're having a, a relationship with the right person. How do we figure that out? Because that, like, the age-old question is like, are they right for me? Are they not? How do how do we know that? Well, if you're heard of your gut, <laughs> I you, have you, heard of it. Yes. Okay, you go by your gut. In other words, you there you you have an intuition, believe it or not, that most of us don't really dig into. We don't really feel it, but we do. It's called intuition, uh, and intuition is that feeling you get that that just you just know, you know, when something's right. And so, um, you know, you say, I'm going to go with my gut. Uh, and so what, what here, you have two parts of your body that are important. One is your mind and then your heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your heart is kind of like your gut. Okay. You go with your heart and your mind will get confused. Your mind will, you know, it, you know, you, you think you got to figure it out and you know, you've gone through all the analytics and so forth. But then in the final analysis, you got to kind of go with your heart or your gut, you know, how do you feel? And, and uh, that's the way you, you, you tell if, if a person is going to be a, a good match for you in a, in a partnership. Because, you know, uh, in most companies, and you're probably familiar because you talk to a lot of business leaders, a good company has good people. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I've never heard of a, co a good company having bad people or, or companies with that, that don't have a, a, a good uh, culture and a good, uh, a good uh, relationship with, with their employees. How do we cultivate that? So let's say we have a couple of the right people on the bus, or at least we we had a gut check. 
we went, we think they're the right way. And, and you can do whatever logic hiring process also. That's totally good also. Um, but when you have people that you've got on your team, how do you actually create a culture though? I feel like especially smaller businesses that have like three to 10 or 20 employees, it's, it's all about culture and trying to figure out how to do this. So what tips do you have for us? Well, um, it depends upon the kind of business you're going to run. Um, you know, whether or not you're going to be, you know, working, you know, offline or, you know, working at distances, you know, maybe you're not in the same office, um, you know, and that's a little more difficult because you're really not getting a face to face on a regular basis. So when you uh, uh, want to put together a, uh, you know, a team, whether you're going to be offline or you would, you know, away from each other or whether you're going to be together, it's communicating properly to have the kind of relationship with them that you, you can really be yourself. You can, you can, you don't have to hide. You don't have to duck and, and bob and weave. You know, you, you're, you, there's a, there's a, a, a culture of honesty. You know, we're going to be honest. Okay. And now integrity is another important one because that's doing what's right when no one's watching, mm. you know, and, and, you know, <laughs> that's that trust thing, you know, do I trust you? And, and so that's another word, really, really important uh, culture to have is, is that trust net loyalty. The third one is is um, not having any condescending language. Don't use abusive, vulgar language toward each other or toward anyone, actually. Uh, and so you show respect. Uh, and that's not easy to do, especially if you're uh, not a mind to, to, to hold your peace and, and to keep your, your, your uh, conscience, as you would clear. You tend just to let loose, and that's that's very very harmful. So have a culture of, of honesty. I mean, of uh, of no condescending language and no vulgarity in in your in your relationship, and then doing whatever it takes. You know, I mean, you know uh, that that means that you're willing to make make amends for your mistakes because we all make mistakes, mm -hmm. and so if you're willing to correct your mistake, so that mistake doesn't hurt the company or hurt the organization. That's doing whatever it takes. And that's really the, the culture we had at Mike Krell. And that one I would recommend that uh, uh, if you're a new company or if, if you're an older one, you know, is to put together a culture that where, where, where there's love and respect for each other. When when you're in a leadership position and you're getting better at leadership, but are you know, you haven't been in the game all that long enough to really know the nuances of it, especially when it comes to talking about others. I know people have tried to put on like a, don't talk about each other or no drama. And when you have employees that are sort of going off the rails, how do you, as a leader, get them to swoop back in? Because you're the one that's the masthead that really makes a big difference. But when when it feels like your culture is going off, what do you do? Well, again, you you have to set the example. Mm -hmm. And and if you're going off the rails, if you're, you know, losing it, uh, of course, you know, then that just encourages the rest of the organization to lose it. And, and so, you know, you have to be the peacemaker, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. You know, you got to you got to kind of calm them down, you know, get them together. And if you're considered a, a, a well-respected, what we call an elder statesman. Mm -hmm. um, so they're actually let's let's go, let's go through that a little bit, because yeah. this is this is an important uh, concept to understand. There's four stages that we go through. The first one's called the eager neophyte. The eager neophyte is somebody who enthusiastic comes in. They want to make changes and just are just so great. You know, the, ah, I'm going to make some, I'm going to make a difference. We're going to, we're going to kill it, you know? Uh, and then you find out that really things don't work that way. You know, the, you know, life is not a bowl of cherries and, and that there, you're going to have difficulty. So then you go through the stage called the, 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 um, uh, um, it's, it's called the, uh, darn, I forgot the word, but it's like a, uh, um, Apollo, oh, the polyp stage. You go through the polyp stage. A polyp is a little organism that lives in a big uh, um, ocean, you know, uh, mass. Um, and and so he just say, okay, I, I'll, I'm going to spend some more time with my family. I'm not going to get involved so much. And you you kind of regress. You kind of go underwater. You just say, I'm just I'm just not going to I'm not going to kill myself. It's not worth it. Okay, so the, then at, at some point you get tired of that. And, you know, I'm not going to just sit around, be nobody, and do nothing. So then you go through the what we call the baited bull stage. The baited bull is one is it says, you know, I've learned a game, I know how it's played, and I'm going to take them on head on, and I'm going to kill them all. You know, so you write sophisticated memos, and you just, you know, just become a tiger, you know, and, and a tyrant. And then you find out that that, that they fight back. Okay, and then, and that uh, you're not the only one. 
that, that's out there writing so various memos, you know. And so you say, hmm, this is getting me nowhere being this baited bull. So you go, and then the last stage is the, is the elder statesman. The elder statesman is the one that's figured it all out. He says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do the fighting. I'll let these other guys fight, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay out of the fray. And, but I'm gonna, I, I've learned how to get these people to work together. So that elder statesman stage is, is really where, where, the, where the true entrepreneur, the true leader needs to get to. You know, go quickly through the first three stages and get to the elder statesman stage where you, you are the one who can bring people together, get them to work together, and get them to get, be, be uh, a kind and respectful. Oh, I love this. Okay, so I recommend everybody pausing and determining what let what stage they're in and be radically mm-hmm. honest with yourself, please, because this might be why you're having some issues. So can you uh, describe what the elder statesman uh, arena really looks like? What what on a daily basis does it feel like to be in that level? Well, because you already know who the, who the rest of them are. You know who the eager neophytes are, who the polyps are, and who the baited bulls are. You know You know them. You see them, you, you, you categorize them, and you try to bring them up. In other words, you try to get them through the first three stages to get to that stage of the, of the elder statesman. And so that's what you do. You want to get them all to the point where they work together. You know, they, they, they're going to go through the three stages anyway. So you, but get them through quickly. You know, get them out of that, you know, eager neophyte, polyp, and beta bull. Get them out of that, okay? Get them to the elder statesman where they work together and they see the value in cooperation and collaboration. And so that's, that's, that's the, what, what you do if you're going to have a successful team. It's funny. I was actually just chatting with one of my clients about this, and we made a list of everybody and where they're at in terms of uh, recalibrating them to get uh, on a higher level. I didn't even know about your four stages, but I think that's absolutely amazing. <laughs> now you do. Though. So I know. Now I'm gonna gonna totally use this and, and recommend this video because I think what's when we're completely unconscious and we just see people for people and not realize that we're here to help them evolve, also, right? Because none of us are perfect yet, you know. Uh, so as we move through that, how do we move them through faster? You said move them through. Faster. I would love to know how do you move them through faster, especially depending on how receptive they are. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring up, you said none of us are perfect, right? You said, okay, you know, well, see, already we've already given ourselves an excuse. You know, well, I'm human, you know, you know, so it, you, know, you don't give yourself an excuse. Mm. Try to be perfect, okay? You know, so how do you try to be perfect? Well, because you, you care. In other words, you want to be. And so you, so you, rather than saying, I can't be perfect, I'm human, you know, mm-hmm. you just you say, you know something? We all make mistakes because that's just the nature of being on earth and, and being a human being is that we don't have perfect knowledge. Um, so uh, let's talk about that just for a minute. Uh, so 50% of the decisions we make are wrong. So you, that's flipping a coin. If you flip a coin... It's 50-50, right? Yep. As far as whether you make a good decision. So 50-50 uh, is, is a, a challenge for just the average person because half the decisions are going to be wrong. So now let's look at the, that, at, that a person who's trying to be perfect, okay? Or who or a person who wants to be, uh, you know, the, the decision maker. So if you're good, if you have good intuition, if you can take that intelligent wisdom you have, okay, and then implement that, then you're going to make decisions that are be 70 to 80 percent correct. So that's the key: is to go from 50-50 to more like 70 to 80 percent of the decisions you make are right. And and so that's that's the the key. And so you, you say, well, how do I how do I do that? Well, we we talked about the four cultures: honesty, integrity, dignity, and respect, and doing whatever it takes. Well, you if you have that as an individual, that'll permeate your organization. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so doing whatever it takes is trying to be perfect, isn't it? Think about that. Doing whatever it takes is trying to be perfect because now you're not going to let these mistakes permeate your life. You're going to correct them. You're going to fix them. Mm. Okay, and so that's that's the key uh, to do that. Okay, let's dive into that a little bit. So I'm a recovering perfectionist. So the, I think the nuance that you're talking about is still striving for the betterment, mm-hmm. but not being so self-critical that we almost, you know, shoot ourselves in in the foot based on it, right? 
You mean they'd be over, overly critical of ourselves? You yeah. Know, so, okay. so for me in the perfectionist ten tendency, I'm like, I can be as close to perfect as humanly possible, right? So that's where I'm striving and trying to be perfect made me a little crazy because I was so self-critical of absolutely everything because I can technically do everything better. So trying to do everything better, but then the weight of what that is of trying to do absolutely everything in your life to the nth degree, because val a value of mine is excellence, right? Where is that line of now I'm just making myself crazy trying to be perfect at absolutely everything? Well, uh, you, can, you can step back and, and, and just say, what, what am I doing that's causing me then to lose you know, perspective? Perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and, and so stepping back and, and saying, okay, what is it? What is it that I'm doing where I'm not, where I'm not seeing it? I don't, I'm not getting it. Okay. And, and, and that'll help you then see how, how far you're push, pushing. So for example, if being critical with yourself means you're going to be critical of others, mm -hmm. that's, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Being critical of yourself is not so bad. Okay, providing it doesn't ex extrapolate over to being critical of everyone else. Uh, and I think that may be the, the struggle that you're having is your 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 criticality, as you would, is is extending out to to everyone because mm. you want everyone to be perfect. Okay, and uh, not everybody has the same mindset you do about that. Mm. Okay, okay, but and, it's still and, a valid a valid thing to be pushing forward as long as I'm not overly critical of other people. Exactly. You know, you know, look, you know, when you point your finger, four of them are pointing back or three yes. of them, I should say, are pointing back. Yes. So make sure that, you, that you're not being critical uh, of them in order to, to improve yourself as you mm. would. Self-responsibility on that, though, too. Like, OK, yes, I can get better and I can keep moving forward on that. One of the things that I love that you said, though, is 50-50 or even 70 or 80 percent. That still means that 30 to 50 percent, even when we're going by our gut of our decisions are wrong. And I know it's if perfectionist tendencies in me, but also in most entrepreneurs, they, making wrong decisions is difficult because then there's usually an aftermath. So what do you tell people about making wrong decisions, knowing that they're going to do it anyway? Well, so... Um... There's a saying that goes, yesterday is history, mm -hmm. tomorrow is a mystery, today is the present, that's why they call it a gift. So you can only change what you can do today. You can't change yesterday, you can't change tomorrow. So, you know, you just, you just move on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you know, the, uh, if we had perfect hindsight, okay, then we wouldn't, we'd be 100% decision or, or correct. Um, so you say, well, why is it then we can't have 100% perfect decisions? Okay, well, you can, it's just, gonna, that's, that's gonna, you're gonna have to go to, to an, a level that, that, that only God can become, as you would. Uh, and, you know, because we don't have that perfect hindsight, that perfect 2020 vision. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like going you know, back to the future as, mm -hmm. as, that, as that movie goes, you know. You can't go back and change it, because yesterday's history, okay? You have to move on. And, and so, but, but by, by moving on and learning from the mistakes you make means you make fewer and fewer and fewer. You can get to that point where you can move up to 70 or 80%. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think anyone living here on earth can make 100% correct decisions. Now, you said they were called wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. I'd rather call them, they, they weren't the best decision. There's good, better, best, okay? Great. So, you, you know, you, you may have not made the best decision, not necessarily wrong, just not the best. And best comes through experience. You know, so what is what is wisdom? Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. You know, you can go to school, get a PhD, but unless you can know how to apply that, unless you know how to really use that knowledge to work for you, okay, you're not wise. And so the 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 more experience you get, the more you try to to do whatever it takes, no excuses. The more you try to be a more kind and, and loving person, mm -hmm. you're going to find the happier you're going to be and the better your decisions are going to be. Uh, I love all of this. Okay. And it's funny because a pattern that kept coming up over and over from all these millionaire interviews, there's no excuses and then no matter what, right? Like, so there's a, there's an intense drive, but recalibration, especially like you're saying for every decision, what is your decision-making process? Like give us the wisdom of how you make a decision. Well, of course, experience is helping. Okay, so uh, I would say that um, just having the right culture, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have, being an honest person, having high integrity, 
okay, respectful of other people, just comes. It, it, it just helps you make the right decisions. It, it helps you become a better leader. If you will implement these the, the, the cultures that I, I talked about, um, you know, integrity is so important. You know, doing what's right when no one's watching is so important because it speaks to what kind of of, of uh, leader you're going to be in your organization. And we, we know the companies that have had toxic cultures mm. and they've lacked what we just talked about. You know, you, you take this, I don't know if it's Hen Henry Weinberg or Weinstein or whatever his name is. Yes. You know, he just got 23 years in prison um, because he didn't, he had a toxic culture, you know, abusing uh, of abuse of others yeah. uh, and, and abuse of his power. Uh, and so you can see what that what, what that cost you. So did he make wise decisions? Absolutely not. Okay, he knew better, but he let his carnal desires get in the way of of his judgment. Mm -hmm. And 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 you're going to face that. All of us are going to face overcoming this carnal feeling to to just you know. I, I I break it down to two parts. I talk about there's greed and then there's selfish. Uh, and there's guilt. So greed and guilt, okay? Mm -hmm. Greed is inward. This is what I want. This is for me. When you when you have guilt, it's because you're reaching out. You're like a Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. okay? It, it's that not focusing on yourself. It's focusing on other. We call that guilt feelings. That that conscience we have. And but when it's when it's something we want, when we have to have it, that's greed. And so criminals, people who are dishonest have this greed mentality. So the greed overcomes their guilt feelings. They, they're conscious. They don't, they don't have a good conscience. And, and so, so you want to be more focused outward rather than inward. And, and that's what my employees saw in me was I was more concerned about them than I was myself, mm -hmm. like a mother Teresa, mm -hmm. you know, and I called it a guilt feeling because that's what our conscience does is it makes us feel guilty. <laughs> okay, and, and it makes us want to do what's right. Okay, so you know, focus outward as opposed to focus inward, and you'll find your decisions become much better. See, so, okay, so as you're going through, because there's different levels too, right? I'm sure as, as you started getting more power and more money, that's when it starts to get a little like, ooh, now I can make recalibrate and make a new decision that could be horribly bad, like you're saying, like Weinstein or whatever, like the abuse of power. Do you feel like that's a, a moment in time where you, you have a recalibration point in your brain, right? Because I feel like I see a lot of entrepreneurs that when they're at the beginning and they're like striving and going, it's like, oh, okay, they've got a massive amounts of integrity. Then when they start going and getting power and money and ego, and it's like, hmm, what hap what's going on over there, right? I feel like it's more um, like their desire can become greater and they have to choose one path or another, right? It's it's more intense potentially. What do you say about sort of that stuff and sticking to your inner workings? Well, that's where humility comes in. So mm -hmm. if, if you gain power and, and uh, capability and humility doesn't follow, <laughs> you're going to make the Henry, Henry Weinstein mistake. Okay. Yep. You're not going to, or, or the, or the Bill Clinton mistake, you know, you're, you're not going to make good decisions uh, and they're going to come back to haunt you. So, you know, uh, with increased power and increased authority comes increased responsibility. Mm. And with that responsibility is humility. Keeping that, that under control, keep that power and that and that uh, that ability to 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 do things that you shouldn't do. Keep them in control, and and that's what we've been talking about in in the cultures of honesty and integrity, isn't it? Keeping them in control, keeping them in perspective, mm -hmm. and and you say, oh, well, that's so hard to do. Well, fine, then then you know then don't become a powerful person, you know. But, you know, if you can if you can become a powerful person with honesty and integrity, mm. think what that can do for others. Mm. You can be you can become a power for good an influence for good. That's exactly why I say on the show, like the people that have integrity need to have the money, too, and the power. And they need to be, you know, uh, self-responsible, but also know their own worth, because sometimes the people that have the greatest integrity aren't actually, you know, don't have the power to be able to do anything with it, which, you know, I really feel people need to sort of step up into that. How do you? Well, do oh, yeah, go ahead. But, I, but, but I still think, you know, I, I know you're you've 
you say, well, all the people with power, all people with integrity and honesty don't have the, the power to do it. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's those people who have that honesty and integrity that we want to give that power to. I agree. That we, okay. And, and, and so uh, it's, it's, um, it's, if it's how you gain your power is what's important. If you get, if you gain that power and authority, honestly, then that integrity and that honesty will, will flow with it. Mm-hmm. If, however, you gain that power illegally or dishonestly, you know, Harvey Weinstein is an example, or some of the other people that we will not mention, uh, then, then, then of course, it's just going to carry on. That power and authority only only going to amplify this dishonesty that you have in your heart. Mm. I I just feel like some people hold themselves back for uh, confidence reasons or for all sorts. They don't do things no matter what or whatever the reasons are that they hold themselves back. Even if they have amazing integrity and amazing this or that, the other thing, sometimes they're either too self-critical, they can't get out of their comfort zone. There's just so many reasons as to why some of the people don't have an effect and the power that they could have if they sort of tried to grow faster or, or, you know, took the harder, the harder road. It doesn't even have to be harder road. I mean, just pushing themselves outside of their comfort zone to something more. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah. So, you know, I wrote this book called tough things first. Yes. And, and the reason I wrote that book was to, to, people said, well, how'd you do what you've done? How'd you accomplish that without, you know, kind of falling by the way of the world. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and I tell them, because I learned to do the tough things first, you know, pr- procrastination is, is something we all suffer. And so the ability to be able to love the things you hate is the key to becoming that successful you that you want to be. That means every morning when you get up, you got to eat that ugly frog first. Mm. Get take Take care of the thing you don't want to do Get it out of the way so that you'll be more effective for the rest of the day. And so that's that's a key to 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 overcoming this. Well, I can't do it. I mean, I'm I'm not. I don't have the knowledge. I'm you know, I can't. I don't. I'm. I don't want to take the risk. You know, and you start coming with all your excuses. Mm-hmm. That's just procrastinating. That's just another form of procrastination. Where is the line? Because I love talking about this stuff, especially because we, we talk about being in flow and not hating all the work that you have. But you're saying, actually, even if you hate it, just do it anyway. So where is that Because you line? learned it. There's no line. You know, Emerson said, Walter Emerson, mm-hmm. he's a poet. Yeah. He said, that, that which we persist in doing becomes easier. Mm-hmm. Not that the nature of the test, test changes, but our ability to perform it becomes easier. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the line is go over the line. Mm-hmm. Just do that tough thing. Do that. Eat that ugly frog. OK, learn to love the things you hate, even if it's a, like mowing the lawn. OK, and you say, oh, how important is it mowing the lawn? It only to the degree is that you've learned to, to love it because it flows into other things. If if you have the the this procrastination uh, uh, treat as you would, mm-hmm. uh, it's going to flow into everything. It's going to flow into the way you treat your family, the way you t- treat yourself, the way you treat your your, your employees. Okay, because you, you're going to say, well, you know, no one's perfect, you know, and and you know, and that, that's something I really don't need to do and don't have to do. But if you can love, learn to love the things you don't like doing. Mm-hmm. Think which power that gives you. Think the mm. ability you, you'll have to be able to tackle any task. Like your finances, which most entrepreneurs don't want to look at. <laughs> and we, you need to. I don't know what to tell you, but you really do. <laughs> it's really helpful. How do, you, how do you change that? What if, do you have any examples or how you've actually internally changed something? Because hate is a very strong word. And to switch from mm-hmm. hate to love is, it seems like a big chasm that we need to jump over. Well, back to what Emerson said, you know, that which we persist, mm. we have to persist in doing it. You ha- it's like saying, okay, I'm going to exercise an hour a day, or I'm going to cut back on my all, uh, you know, my, all, my, you know, fat foods and the s- stuff that's uh, going to cause me problems physically. Uh, so you know, you just you, you you just have to really be willing to to fight that inner desire to procrastinate to put off, okay? Um, and you know, we we every you know year we we talk about New Year's resolutions, mm-hmm. and, and and New Year's resolutions are, are what we say are, are rules to be broken. <laughs> so people say, oh, I'm not going to make a resolution because then I'll just break it, you know. So if you if you look at, uh, at, at really, you know, you shouldn't be making resolutions 
in, in the sense of the word that they're to be broken. Habits are easy to form and hard to break. Mm. Good habits are very hard to start, okay, and but are, you know, easy to, to you know, to break. So, you know, we just got to remember that a good habit is is not easy to start, but it's very easy to break. And so you want to make sure that you get on the on the, on the side of, of of starting a good habit mm-hmm. and keeping it, mm-hmm. and and so that's what I say. Loving the things you hate, it, it, it sounds difficult. It sounds how can I possibly love to do something that I hate doing? Because I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep persisting at it until until I'm good at it. Then I won't hate it. You know, I, I swear to you, there's there's virtually nothing that I hate to do. That's amazing. And that and that's and that's why I get so much done. Is because it, it doesn't bother me. You know, don't worry about loving the things you love because that's easy, right? Find the things you don't like. You know, go after the ones of things you say, I hate. Oh, I hate that. Then, then you say, okay, I'm gonna fix that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go at that. You know, full bore. You know, and and so um, we're all the same in the sense of the word that we we would rather take the easy path. But the easy path is not the most productive and the most worthwhile. Mm. In fact, I gave a talk uh, Monday, just a couple of days ago, um, on tough things aren't free. That was the talk I gave. So, you know, they you know, say the best things in life are not free. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I said tough things aren't free. And so we know that, uh, you know, if we're going to do the tough things, that's not going to be easy to do, okay? And so you got to you got to work at it. And I, love that and I you will said pro- that you love everything. Like that that's an amazing gift that you have given yourself to be able to love everything. And I didn't know that it was totally possible. So I really appreciate you saying that you are a shining example of it. How do how do we actually help empower our employees to feel that same way? Because you set the example. In other words, you're you're willing to pick up a piece of paper that's on the floor. You're willing to wipe off the counter in the bathroom that's got water all over it. You know, you you're willing to you know to do things. Put the you know take you know, take a, a can of trash out and dump it in the trash container. Um, you know, you're you're you just show it. You you show it the way you dress. You're you're dressed impeccably. You know, you don't you're not sloppy. You don't you know you're just you you're you're well kept. Um, and you 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 speak with with good English. You know, you have proper, you have proper English. Your, your memos are good memos. You know, your, your um, phone calls are good phone calls. You know, you, you just the good, you do good podcasts, you know, <laughs> you, you just do things, you do things right. And, and, and so people, people relate to that. They admire that and they just, they want to follow. They, they want to follow that leadership. Um, you know, we had the lowest turnover in the entire industry. Mm-hmm. Um, in half the, the turnover everybody else had. Uh, and so our employees loved to be there. They, they wanted to come back. Half the employees that left our company wanted to come back. Okay. Because they love the feeling. I mean, you, you, you know what it's like when you had the, you, you go to a restaurant and the, and the food's good and you want to come back. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's the same thing with a company. You know, if, if, if the environment's good, they kind of want to come back. They won't want to leave. And, and so just have that kind of environment. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you, you set the example, dress properly, act properly, speak properly, you know, treat your people properly. What if we screw up on the properly part? We have, we have leeway in not always being proper every, cause, cause when we move through and especially I know, I know for me when things get stressful or when things, when I'm unaligned, it's way easier to, you know, not take the right action or do the hard stuff or all those things when I'm feeling off. You know, do you have to feel like you're in alignment or even when you have really, really bad days, you go, I'm just going to grit and bear it. And, you know, how do you not show that to your employees and all that fun stuff, too? Well, you don't want to show it. You know, if if you're um, not doing well, you, you don't want to come across as not doing well. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want to become a victim. Um, and so, you know, the last thing we want is to have a victim mentality. Mm-hmm. And And so, you know, you sound a little more like a victim in that case, you know. Uh, and so you want to stay aligned. You want to stay in, in form as you would. Uh, and, and if you find yourself drifting, you, you pull back, you can roll, you get yourself back in line again. It's not easy. Th- these things aren't not simple. 
I appreciate that. And so, that. you know, <laughs> well, I mean, that's why in this, in this, in that uh, thing that Emerson wrote, you know, persist. You have to persist, persist, persist. And and if you don't persist, then you're going to you're gonna become a laggard. You're going to drift off. Mm. Um, and so, you know, if you want to stay on the straight and narrow, you know, you have to keep yourself in alignment. Uh, and you say, well, that's a lot of work, you know, and I don't know. And, and you get discouraged. You know, you're saying, boy, this is killing me to stay in alignment, you know, because I'm having to always make sure I'm prim and proper. And, I'm always, and, and you know, I just like to be able to kick back. I like to have a what they call a dress down Friday. I like this kind of, you know, let my, let my hair down, just kind of. Let me let me kind of go off and 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 just kind of relax. Well, you know, it, make sure if you want to do that, you're not around others to do it. You know, if you're going to go off off the deep end or, or or realign yourself, make sure you go off so that you're not exposing that to others. It's kind of like having the coronavirus. You know, <laughs> you, know you you just you just don't expose other people to it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I really appreciate that you're saying because everybody has off days and to be able to um, not have that off day affect everybody else, right? Because it doesn't have to and to make that choice internally. Where does self-care come into all this though? Do you do a lot of self-care? Do you feel like that really matters so that way you can prevent burnout or, or how does that work for you? Well, I mean, I make sure I have enough gas in my tank so I don't burn myself out. Yeah. Uh, and and so, you know, you know, there, there's times when I will I – will, relax and, and as they say kick back but i don't do it in a way so that i influence others okay, okay so so um you know i mean th we have a certain amount of modesty you know i dress properly and and so that i don't want to become immodest and and you know walk around the house naked as you would uh and so i <laughs> you know we keep our we have you know keep keep ourselves in in you know in, in proper alignment so that you know if we are going to kick back make sure we do it properly and and that we don't just expose others to it how do you how do you keep air in your tank well because i fill it every minute of the day in other words i just i i re-energize myself how tell I, me more <laughs> well you know on on in this podcast i was excited and, and looking forward to it as opposed to saying oh man i got this podcast you know and i gotta get up early and get ready and and uh, and then I got to start thinking about what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it. I don't do that. You know, I, I, I look forward to it. I look, I, I'm, I'm energetic. I'm enthused. I'm, I'm just excited. Um, you know, I taught, what, four classes in the last, well, five, no, five classes in the last two days. Uh, and, you know, and uh, I look forward to it. It, it was I was enthusiastic and and and, and energetic. And, and, uh, the, and the students could tell. Yeah. They, they could see that I was. Uh, and, and they, and they really related to it. You know, um, I didn't act like this was a burden, didn't act like it was a, a challenge. So anyway, that's, well, that's, that's how I do I it. I just, I just, I just, I just, well, you know, I just keep, I just keep myself pumped up. How? Like, was that, was that innate? Have you always sort of been an optimist or is it something that you've cultivated over time? I cultivated it. Hmm. I, I, you know, I, I, I energize myself. I eat the right foods. I exercise every morning. Um, you know, I get a good night's rest. Um, I never let my hair down, honestly. So no matter what, even if you're on vacation, do you do you do all the things? Uh, exactly. Even on vacation, I do. I you know because you know good habits are easy to break. Yeah. And they're hard to start. And I don't want to get into bad habits. So yeah. I, I just, it's, it's a, it's an everyday, it's an everyday thing. Remember I said earlier, yesterday is history. Tomorrow's a mystery. Today's the present. That's why they call it a gift. Mm -hmm. I, ha I have to do the very best I can every single day. Then I have no regrets. I honestly have no regrets at all. That's amazing. Well, that's how everybody wants to live, right? That's the biggest, you know, regret when you're dying. It's like, oh, I wish I would have done this, that, and the other thing. You're a shining example of not doing that, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, do you feel like it's rigid sometimes, though? Do you feel like sometimes you do want to not be as rigid? Well, what, what do you, okay, when you say rigid, you mean stiff? <laughs> well, kind of, yeah, like always doing the right thing no matter what. Well, I mean, what what's wrong with doing the right thing no matter what? I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, 
you know, people may criticize you, you know, they, they say, Hey, you know, you, you need to smell the roses and, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's it reminds me of the story of these uh, two um, uh, young men that were always late home t- from, from school and they didn't get their, their chores. These were farm kids. Okay. And they did weren't, and their mother was saying, you know, you, you know, you, Stop staying around playing basketball. Come home. You got to milk the cows. You got to take care of the animals. And so they, her, her, the mother said, if you do this uh, again, you know, you're going to get a severe punishment. So on the way home, they were late and they thought, well, we'll just hurry along. And they said, well, we're, we're going to miss the, the, the time deadline to get home. And they said, let's cross this field. But there's a big bull over there and he'll charge and he'll injure us. And and and. Uh, the uh, the boy said, "Well, let's sneak across. They won't. They, so the won't wake. He won't wake up. And so they began sneaking across the field. And sure enough, the bull woke up, and and the bull started charging at at, at the boys. And uh, the 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 boys uh, said, "Well, let's let's kneel and pray." And one boy said, "Let's kneel and pray." And the other boy says, "Well, let's pray and run." You know. So you know, you you gotta you you just gotta keep going. Even when you make a mistake, you just pray on the run as you would and not let that be a deterrent. Uh, and and I know that some of, of your listeners are going to say, oh, man, that sounds like too hard. To... Well, in, anything in life worthwhile is going to be difficult. That's why I said earlier I taught this one class on tough things aren't free. Mm-hmm. And so doing what's right at all times is is not free. It's not easy, but it pays off. You'll have a happier life. And uh, and somebody, oh, that's not like a boring. That's not like a that 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 doesn't sound like a fun life. Well, you know, remember the story of Pinocchio, right? I mean, you know, you 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 obviously, you know, you can have the fun time, but you're going to pay a price for it. Mm. And so, um, you know, I think uh, it's important for us to, even though to some people this will sound very boring and very difficult and 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 not fun to them, fine. And, and, and let them live, live their life the way they are. Mm. But those who want to change, those who want to become happier and, and, and more accomplished, you know, listen to what we're saying. Mm. I know most people at the end of their lives want to have no regrets and be happy. And the, like I said, you're a shining example of that. So people can totally take what they will and keep moving forward no matter what. I so appreciate this. I know we have to start wrapping up. So what's one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? Do the tough things first, honestly. That's the thing. They, they, one thing I think they should do. They should persist in doing what's right. Mm. Persist in doing what's right. Don't fall into the uh, uh, worldly view of well, you know, let live and let live. You know, you know, uh, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. You know, forget about that. You know, just, just, just try your best to be the best every day. And have no regrets. Try make make a resolution not to have a regret, not to regret anything. Just and then the way you do that is just try every day to do your best, mm-hmm. and and then you'll end up with a with a happy a very happy life. Um, I'm celebrating my 59th uh, marriage this year to my wife, and uh, you know so 59 years we've been together, uh, and and that took a lot of effort. And that means I had to make her more important than 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 I was felt on myself. In other words, I I you know try to make her happier and 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 make her life more fulfilling. And she does the same for me. So you know we're here we are, 59 years. That's a that's a long time. Uh, and uh, and and we did it because we cared about each other. And we work every day to do our best. Um, as an example. This may sound strange because I've been a CEO and executive for years. I help her make the bed. I clean up the dishes off the table. Okay. Good. I help wash. Yay. The dishes. <laughs> I'm excited. Good. I, I do. <laughs> you know, I help clean that. I help clean the house. Okay. I, I do things that, that, that other people look at. Well, that's not my bill or my dignity. I don't want to do that. Okay. And, but I, I, I don't want her to feel that way. I don't want her to feel that what she's doing is less important. So by my doing it shows how important I think it is. Mm. So that's, I even take her clothes shopping. Can you imagine that? You know, it's, <laughs> it's taking a woman clothes shopping. That's not easy, you know, 
<laughs> for a man to take their wife clothes That's shopping. That's amazing. Uh, that should be yeah. on everybody's list right now, too. Yeah, it means the world to them, surprise. As long as you don't complain while you're doing I it. Know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. no, I know. No, I don't. You know, I mean, I, I, I have to sit there and I have to kind of keep smiling and and uh, not acting distressed, <laughs> you know, and she's trying on one thing after another thing, after another thing, after another thing, after another thing, you know, and uh, That's amazing. I just say, love it. <laughs> See, <laughs> love so, what you hate. Yes. Come, well, yeah. So I, I say, come what may and love it. Mm -hmm. Come what may and love it. Okay. That's that's something that that uh, that that you can take away. Also, we've said several things, but come with me and love it. I love it. You should write a book about marriage after <laughs> doing the tough things first in marriage. Good job. Thank you for sharing that. I love it. Where can we find more about you online and pick up your book? Well, we have a website. It's called Tough Things First dot com, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a podcast that we do every week. We we share a podcast. I also wrote my second book, uh, Zen of Zen, which is a marriage book, as you would. It's it's in how to live your life, um, and, and and what you can do to improve your life every day, uh, on different subjects and different topics. Uh, so that's another book that they can read. So what I like to do is I like to write things about how to people help people become better people. Mm -hmm. In fact, I told my employees, you know, I said I'm not here to make you rich. That's your job. I'm here to help you become a better person. Honestly, you may not believe this, but that's exactly what I promised them. Mm -hmm. I promised to help you become a better person. What's that worth to you? And I said, within two or three years, you'll come and tell me that being here working for the company, you have become a better person. And I have stories about that. I have examples that, that, that where people have come to me that I didn't even know, you know, employees, because we had over a thousand people that, uh, and, and didn't even know but I had him come say, you know, you saved my marriage. You know, you helped me become a better person. I became a better wife or a better husband, a better spouse, whatever. Uh, and and see, to me, that that's that that's the win. That that's how I feel. I win is when I can help somebody become a better person. Not necessarily more wealthy, mm -hmm. but how can I help you become better? And that's the purpose of this podcast today: is how can I help your listeners become better? you already have. <laughs> this is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your gift of helping everybody else on the show today. I really appreciate it. And of course, we'd love to have you back sometime. You bet. Love to do it. Thank you for listening and investing in yourself with your time. I so appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this episode, I would be forever grateful if you would be willing to leave a rating or review in whatever app you use for your podcast. I know that's what really bumps it up in the rankings. And I would so appreciate your time, especially if you've been a long time listener. But of course, if you like this episode and you're brand new, thank you for being here too. Have an amazing, amazing day.